If I started talking about Jessica Jones and Luke Cage, you'd probably think I was chatting about Netflix. But no, they've got two brand new books coming out this week, as well as a whole bunch of others. Let's check them out. What's up, everybody? I'm Stan, and welcome to Detail Comics, where we go over comics in detail. This is Shuffle Peel, the weekly show where I go over the books that I picked up and give you an idea as to what I think about them and whether there's something you should go back to the comic book shop for. To start off with, we're going to go with Justice League number six. And I know that I said that I pulled this off my pull list, and I did, and my shop had it on there anyway. So I decided to buy it to see if it was worth something redeeming, and I didn't find it. So it's definitely not something I'm going to be picking up. This just really cemented that fact. So after we jump off of Justice League, we're going to end up with all-new Wolverine, and this is going to be issue 13, and that's the beginning of The Enemy of the State Part 2. Well, not really Part 2, but Take 2, with Laura Kinney, X-23, as Wolverine. I was really scared was going to be set up by Civil War 2, and it does play a couple things, but it's really just a bit of a stretch. The reasoning for the entire event is a little bit thin, and I'm really hoping that Tom Taylor can take us someplace, but as of right now, it looks like it's some sort of setup with a, an old arch-nemesis, former mentor of Laura Kinney's back when she was a weapon, trying to take her out and make her a target. So uh, we'll see where that goes, but overall the start isn't really where it needs to be to grab me. But then we can make our way from Wolverine to Doctor Strange. So issue number 12 is really the beginning of the next arc after the last days of magic, and that's called The Blood in the Ether. And this is going to see basically the resurgence of a lot of Doctor Strange villains that are looking to take on the Doc and get his head for their own, you know, claim it for their trophy wall. And we see on Monday he takes on Mr. Misery, a new character that's the living embodiment of all the pain and suffering caused by Doctor Strange. And then we've got Baron Mordo, Dormammu makes an appearance, and also Nightmare. And this is just awesome. It's going to be such a fun book, and Doctor Strange really cements itself as easily the best title, or one of the best titles, that Marvel's currently putting out today. Definitely a recommendation if you have the chance to pick it up. Instead of beginning an arc, we're going to be finishing up the Before Dead No More stage of Amazing Spider-Man with issue number 19. And in this, we see a little bit more of Miles Warren, or the Jackal, because we don't really know if it's Miles Warren or not yet. And we see his hench people, we see this entire situation, and ultimately, Peter Parker makes a call that causes someone their life, which is... Terrible to see, because we know how Peter Parker takes those kind of things. But it really sets up a bit of conflict for him in the future. I'm not really sure where Dan Slott's going to take this, and really the clone conspiracy next week is the only thing that's going to give us a bit better indication of that. But in the back of this book, you can see exactly what kind of crossover this is, and it's overwhelmingly involving. You've got the clone conspiracy, Amazing Spider-Man, Silk, and the Prowler, at least the four books that are going to be involved in this. So if you want to you know, stay current, those are the ones you got to grab. While we're ending Dead No More, we're also going to talk about the end of Tony Stark. Uh, I'm not really sure what's going on in this book, but Invincible Iron Man 14 is a very interesting take because it takes Tony out of the Iron Man armor almost entirely. He's avoiding his life completely, and then he finds his way to an AA meeting because it's necessary. And who does he run into? Captain Marvel. You can't really escape this Civil War II stuff, and ultimately there's this last page cliffhanger reveal, which is so Brian Michael Bendis, that makes us have to read Civil War and the following Invincible Iron Man book, which I was going to read anyway. You know, I want to see what Riri Williams does, but the fact that he's couching the fate of Tony Stark into these other books, I find that a little bit frustrating. Hopefully Tony's not dead, but we know that he's been killing off characters left and right, so who knows what Brian Michael Bendis is going to do. But I do know what some writers are going to do, and somebody like Peter J. Tomasi on Superman number 8 is just going to start writing good stories. So it starts out with a father-son science fair project and ends up with Superman and Superboy fighting dinosaurs on a mysterious island lost in the middle of nowhere, and they can't find a way to escape. This is not necessarily the book that I was expecting, because it's really an homage to Darwin Cook, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. And it really seems to be uh, their way of saying, you know, thank you for everything you've done. And it's not necessarily going to be setting up the next big story arc, which I'm okay with. If this is a one or two part series that's really out there to, you know, show his appreciation for Darwin's contribution to comics, I'm all for those kind of stories. And it seems like it's going to be pretty entertaining for what it is. But as long as we're beached on mysterious islands, we should start talking about Green Arrow. So in issue number eight, 
things get a little hot and heavy between Dinah Lance and Oliver Queen. It's a uh, almost Vertigo title, mature audiences only, but it's definitely fun, and I like the way that Ben Percy's writing this. The story sets up a you know a pretty decent story arc where you've got a little bit of a search and rescue mission, and it's great to see the team up of Green Arrow and Black Canary back again. And the romance is a very fun and lighthearted aspect of the book. It's a it's a very welcome return and. To be honest with you, I was never really expecting to be such a fan of Green Arrow, but it's definitely a book that's made it onto my top recommendations as far as DC Rebirth goes. Another book that I've been enjoying is Batman. So in Batman number 8, we see the continuation of Night of the Monster Men. This is part 4. And, man, it feels like it's just struggling to move forward. Uh, you know, like a giant monster trying to make its way through the city. It's just not... the pacing is relatively slow. And it's... There's so many convenient kind of solutions to this particular problem. It gets me a little frustrated uh, in times. Uh, I have nothing against Steve Orlando, and it looks like he's put a lot of effort into this. But as we can kind of see in the continuation, which is Nightwing number six, it's it's barely consequential that Gotham Girl and Dick Grayson's Nightwing were turned into monsters. And that's such a huge pinnacle kind of point. You can play on that for so long. That could have been a whole damn book. And no, we get like two and a half pages of a little bit of fan service, you know, a little bit of battle, but nothing really too terribly crazy. And not being sophisticated scientists, Duke and, and uh, Alfred somehow come up with this antidote for blah, 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 blah. The only real key point of Nightwing number six and of this Night of the Monster Men story is the fact that Hugo Strange evidently has done some sort of psychoanalysis on Batman and is preparing for his final showdown while two monsters are ravaging the city. This could easily have been a story that was told in two or three issues at most, and I would have been totally fine with that. But, hey man, Detective's coming up next week, so let's see what that has in store for us. Now that we made it out of current books, we can hop into new number ones with Jessica Jones number one. So for anybody that's been watching the TV series, this is a great introduction. For anybody that was reading the book when it was Alias, that's also a really good return to that kind of thing. Uh, if you've got some sort of continuous continuity where you understand the relationship between Jessica Jones and Luke Cage, that's even better because this book kind of... It hits on everything you want in a Jessica Jones series. She has powers, but she doesn't care to use them, and it's awesome. Uh, and then ultimately we've got a great Luke Cage spotting at the end of this book, and I'm really interested to see where this kind of goes. Definitely an interesting book, and one of the recommendations that I'm going to have for Marvel Now 2.0. It's uh, kind of a surprise. Another surprise for me is Champions Number 1. I know this was one of my most anticipated books, but what I really like about this is that it tells its story very well. I like Ramos's art, which is one of the things that drew me to it uh, overall. And then I like some of the characters that are involved as well. So like Viv from The Vision, Amadeus Cho as the Hulk, Miles Morales as Spider-Man. They're all really good, relatable kid characters. And I can't wait to see like a younger crop kind of rise up and take the mantle. The, the message on the end was a little bit heavy-handed, you know, about people being better and, you know, striving to, to not only protect and seek justice, but do it in the right way, you know, stop punching down on people. But the fact that it was kind of cemented at the end with the whole social media, you know, hashtag champion so lit, uh, I thought that was really funny. It, it was well played. It was, a, it was a book that was meant to grab me and bring me into the title, and it definitely succeeded. If you want to give this one a chance, I recommend it. Definitely go back and pick one up if you haven't had the opportunity. And then we get to a book that might have been a little bit of misdirection, and that's Cage Number 1. So Cage Number 1 by Gendy is it's a great-looking book. I really like the art style. It reminds me of Dexter's Laboratory and all those kind of things, and it's great. But it's a real throwback to the 1970s, set in the 1970s, and has all that kind of black exploitation flair. It's not really something that's for me, and, you know, it's, it's totally okay that it's not for me. It's just not speaking to me in my kind of language. It was definitely entertaining, but not entertaining enough. Another book that didn't have quite enough flavor for me was Death of X number one. And this is a book where we're working very hard to set up that conflict and make sure that we have a rock-solid foundation, or at least a perceived rock-solid foundation, for what's going to be happening in the upcoming Death of X and IVX books. There's a lot of promise in here, but it's just... 
I'm so frustrated with how these things are kind of set up. We're going back eight months, you know, who's getting affected by what. The Terrigen Mist is killing mutants. It's like, what is Gold Balls doing there? Isn't he, like, rooming with Spider-Man in New York City somewhere? I, it, it's going back to this, this bygone age and giving us some needed backstory. It's a bit of a retcon to make sure that everything works. And the biggest question is, are we dealing with the real Scott Summers in this circumstance? I mean, I get that the Inhumans are happy, that they're great, uh, you know, it's great for them, they're being accepted by the world, the X-Men are still outcasts, which is what they're really good at, but it's just, it's working really hard and it's not quite bringing me in. Hopefully number two is going to be a little bit better and it's going to give me a hook, you know, it's going to give me something to grab onto. And something that kind of gave me nothing to grab onto because it was such a trip is Shade the Changing Girl. So Shade the Changing Girl is about some sort of uh, alien demon, gaudy, whatever thing going on inside a coat of madness and it's just like this big acid thing going on all over the place. And I mean, we saw alien sex, we saw underage drug use, we saw skinny dipping and all kinds of other stuff as this being had this out-of-body experience and they slowly drift into madness. Wow. Um, I, this might just be a little too out there for me. I might give issue two a shot, but... Hey, it could be for somebody. I'm glad that you've really connected with this if you're that person, but uh, it might not be for me. But we're going to change pace and go from the super colorful, trippy world of Shade the Changing Girl to the colorful world of black. And it's basically a black and white story that's really got not really a whole lot of variance. There's a few shades of gray in there, but nothing really too strong to kind of break up that contrast. And what the story is is clear. Black people are the only people that get superhero powers. That's really about it. How does that affect the dynamic of the world? And what kind of story is the author trying to tell? We don't really get a very good inclination. And there's definitely some very heavy overtones that are based around recent events inside the United States, which I can totally understand. And if that's going to be a driving force, I want to see what kind of voice that they're going to bring to this story and this topic. I'm going to give it another shot. I'm going to give it at least two or three issues so that that way I can get into the story before I make my final decision. But if you want to keep your politics out of your comic books, it's definitely not something that you want to pick up. However, there is a book that I want to recommend that you pick up, and that's Green Valley number one. So Green Valley is a really interesting story because Max Landis said that he's had this in his brain since he was about 12 years old, and he's finally had the ability to bring it to fruition. And the Knights of Caledonia are that super awesome knight story tale where you've got four people versus 400, and they can just go out and kick ass, and they've got a really funny kind of rapport, they've got a, a great uh, relationship between the group of them. But the story is going to take a, a pretty serious twist towards the end, and that's going to be the driving motivation for the rest of the story arc. At least that's what I hope. So I'm going to at least have to give issue number two a try, but I can easily see myself sticking with it through the entire nine, which is what it's planned out for. Definitely a book I recommend taking a look at and flipping some pages on. And then we have something a bit more ambiguous to finish things out, and that is Moonshine Number 1. So Moonshine Number 1 is a story about the Prohibition-era bootlegging and how that kind of wraps into some very supernatural kind of situations. The town is very hostile to outsiders, and you can definitely tell that something seedy is going on as, you know, a naked man steps out of the woods covered in blood. Is it his or is it someone else's is the question. Because on the indication of this Frank Miller variant cover, uh... Are we talking werewolves? Because werewolves are bootlegging? That might keep me around for issue two. It's definitely something that you should flip through and see whether it's something that you want to kind of connect with. I'm going to go back for a second helping, but you know what? Your mileage may vary on that one. So those are all the books that I picked up this week, but I want to know what you guys grabbed too and what you thought of the ones that I grabbed. You know, we can start that conversation in the comments. As always, if you like what you see, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe down there. Get more news, reviews, and commentary on comic books, comic book movies, comic book TV shows and games, and anything and everything inside the world of comics.